Okay, moving back to our paper speakers tonight then. Shh. Thank you. Our fifth speaker tonight and our last speaker in proposition is Jolien Maun. Jolien is the founder and director of the Good Law Project, a non-profit activist group which aims to achieve change through the law. A barrister, he has taken the UK government to court over Boris Johnson's prorogation of Parliament, the government's response to COVID-19 and the Brexit process. Jolien, you have the floor. Uh, I, I really love points of information. Uh, let me just put that on the, on the record to start with. But I'm only going to take points of information from women. We've heard like, virtually from no women at all in this debate. Uh, you know, I don't want to start off by bollocking my audience, but come on, guys, we can, we can do better than that. Um, so I'm going to take as many points of information from, from women as want to ask them. Um, it is, um, uh, that having been said, uh, really lovely to be here talking about protesting a semi-reformed, middle-aged tax lawyer wearing a, a black tie. Um, Pascal famously placed a bet on the existence of God. He said that even if the God, uh, odds of God existing were infinitesimally small, he would live his life believing. For him, a life in which God did not exist would be a life that was meaningless. Why, you might ask, Am I standing here pretending to be somebody who knows anything about French philosophy? Uh, and a little bit. I thought that would be the vibe. Um, but also, more importantly, we all of us, um, we all of us, particularly uh, those who are at the start of their adult lives, we have to make a choice. We have to make a choice about how we're going to live. Uh, and if you want to be cynical about it, all participation in democratic life is pointless, is to be sneered at, is performative, if you like. The fact is, you could live a thousand lives voting in every general election and never once get to say, but for my vote, the government would be different. So at that really base, cynical level, Democratic participation is pointless. And what's true of voting is also true of every other type of democratic engagement, including choosing to speak about politics and choosing to listen to politics, doing exactly what we are doing at this very moment in this brief interregnum between drinking <laughs> is a performative act. And that's true of the right to protest as well. But we don't protect it because we know it will make a difference. We protect it because we feel a need to respond to a world that seems to us to be in crisis. Because we have to believe that our actions matter, that our lives matter. We have no choice. There is no other way to live our lives. It is what participation in a democracy looks like. Democracy isn't a periodic event. It's not like a wedding anniversary that you do, if you remember, once a year and then you forget about. It's participatory. Every day, um, as Cole Porter sang, was Valentine's Day. And it's an act of love and an act of faith. And by protecting the right to protest, we are choosing to protect the right to participate in, to believe in democracy. And what is articulated in the act of legislating against protest it is a desire that we not participate or that we participate less in the democratic life of our nation, in our futures. Um, this is the 1985 white paper uh, of the then government, which, as you will all know, was a conservative government. Rights of peaceful protest and assembly are amongst our fundamental freedoms. They are numbered amongst the touchstones which distinguish a free society from a totalitarian one. And I watched my friends on the opposite bench clapping at the proposition 
that things here are not as bad as Egypt, a country where opponents of the government are imprisoned without trial, are tortured, are murdered. I have higher aspirations for the United Kingdom, for my country, and so should you. Things are bad here. They are bad here. That's right. There's, there's, there's not really a, I don't sense a question in my immediate future. <laughs> but also, I, I agree with your essential point. The right to protest is the right to protest against power. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm deferring to the, to the chair, if I may. <laughs> Christopher, things are bad. Things are bad. Christopher told you about um, Just Up Oil protesters being arrested this morning. And coincidentally, on the bus on the way here this afternoon, I bumped into Roger Hallam. Roger told me about being arrested in his home at six o'clock. Um, yesterday morning, his 34th arrest, he said with a note of pride, it is fair to say. Um, and he was arrested at six o'clock in the morning for a speech that he had delivered at a festival in August. That is not um, the application of the law to serve any legitimate end. It is the application of the law as an act of harassment, of state-sponsored harassment against its political opponents. There is no other way to read that act of arrest of Roger. And indeed that is true of the other Just Stop Oil protesters as well. Let us look at how the law now stands. Victoria gave you uh, a long and glorious example of protests that we had permitted over the decades. But the proposition is that the government is too harsh on protest today. From whence comes these um, turns, brutal turns of the ratchet? The police can, in consequence of changes in the law made in the last couple of years, criminalise people on a march or a protest if it causes a hindrance that is more than minor. A hindrance that is more than minor is enough to criminalise a march. And in working out whether it is more than minor, police can take into account disruption from unconnected protests in the same area, including by different people on different days. So X causes a minor delay on day one, and unconnected Y causes a minor delay on day two, and the police say the cumulative effect of those two acts is more than minor, and the march is criminalised, and the marches, if they continue, are criminalised. Second example, if you do something that you intend to create a risk, a risk, of serious annoyance to a section of the public, of serious annoyance to a section of the public, you can go to prison for 10 years. For 10 years. Causing serious annoyance should not be a criminal offence at all. I say this as a man. I say this as a man who causes serious offence most days. <laughs> But creating a risk of serious annoyance, punishable by 10 years, really? 
You may say, and many do, well, be real, no one takes these offences at face value. And perhaps that's right today, although taking offences at face value is fundamentally the definition of being a lawyer. They are there, on the law books, these offences ready for a government to wield them as weapons against its people. And they are vague, which means they will have a, have a chilling effect. If you can't afford a conviction, you won't do some things that are legal because you cannot know that they are legal. They will have a, have a chilling effect, especially for those for whom the consequences are especially severe, whose citizenship of the United Kingdom is now conditional following changes made under the Nationality and Borders Act. Let me be clear who I mean by this. I mean um, the uh, anti-protest laws will have a, have a chilling effect on black people and brown people. And that's an important point. That's a really important point. Because the people whose participation in the democratic life of our nation, um, whose participation will be impeded, it isn't me. And uh, with respect to my friend Victoria, who spoke very, very well, it isn't her either, and it isn't Poppy. The police will look at us, they will see our privilege, they will hear our vows, and they will know they are taking on someone who can instruct lawyers, who will be believed by juries, and they will go and pick on lower hanging fruit. They will pick on working class people, and we have seen them do it. They will pick on black people, they will pick on brown people, they will pick on those whose place in society is not as secure as mine is. It will be those who lack social capital. Let me return to Pascal. Other choices are available, but my choice is to live my life believing, to believe in democracy, to believe in protest, to believe in it having value. I can know that unless we strain every sinew against the things that we know are destroying society, destroying the planet, we will lose. I can know that we will lose unless we resist the forces of capitalism that are destroying the planet beyond any shadow of evidential doubt. I think it's an important endeavour. It's a good way for us to choose to live our lives, a necessary act of faith if we are to believe in democracy and it ought to be safeguarded. Perhaps for some of us the stakes are not so high, but they are if you live in the global south. People are dying now, not hypothetically if ambulances are hypothetically blocked by protest. People are actually dying now and they are dying in their tens of thousands in Pakistan. In the global south, Climate change is not some hypothetical future, it is a present, lived or dying reality. We must stop it by any means necessary because the alternative is that we will die not in our tens of thousands, not in our millions, but in our billions.